It's amazing, this Zoom, isn't it? These virtual meetings, it's just crazy. It's been a wonderful way to connect, even though it's, you know, preferred to be in person, it's really in many ways very helpful. Good morning well, that... and welcome. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We're going to let people trickle in, so we'll just settle in. Hi, Carol and Lydia. We have the whole family <laughs> practically. Oh, hi, whole family. <laughs> just want to make sure my audio works. Yesterday it didn't. Okay, thank you. Judy is Zacharoff. No, there's no Judy. There's an Anna. It should because it's your computer, so. Well, that's true. Too. There's Anna right there. Yeah. Yes. Anna, we can't see your whole face. We can only see your eyes. Oh, well, my eyes are an important part. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they are. There There's Iris. Go. Hi, Iris. How are you? Hi. I can't see you. Can you see me? I yeah. can, yeah. Okay, let me try a few things here. Ah, oh, there you are. I got gotcha. you. Hi, how are you? Hey. Good, Hello. good, good. Welcome. Good morning. Mike, how are you? I'm well, thanks. How you doing, Mikey? What's up, Steve? I saw you at the pool this morning. You did? Yeah, I was coming in. You were leaving. All right, so you got to make sure that you, you pencil out Monday to take the pictures of that golf outing for us, the 28th. Okay, you were going to do that for me, right? Yeah. Okay. Because I'm counting on you because we're not bringing another photographer in there, okay? Mike, we um... – All right, we just have a couple more trickling in. This is great. So nice to see everyone. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> so who is Kevin from Devon? Okay, here we go. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's it's actually it's actually Kevin from Devon. Kevin from Devon. Devon. <laughs> Devon. Where is Devon? Oh, in uh, just outside Philadelphia. Uh, ah, okay. Great. Yeah. Is that one of your Welcome. What is that called? The CMT. Sorry. All right. Well, it's ten oh two. Clark, if you do you want to get started or give it another minute? I don't know. Room I think we should get started. Okay. So welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm Clark Sims. I'm the head of the Baltimore branch of the CMTA and uh, Laurel helped me set up this meeting, Laurel Richardson. Um, we have a very, very special guest speaker. We have Dr. Stephen Shearer. Um, I just wanted to say a couple things real quickly first. Um, this is CMT Awareness Month. We are currently about halfway through CMT Awareness Month, and there are virtual walks and virtual rides going on all over the place. And I would encourage people to either donate or to participate or to organize their own if they're up for it. Um, the other thing I wanted to say was there's currently a match in place. There's a match up to $200,000. So if you had in mind to donate this year, I would encourage you to do it now because the impact will be doubled. Uh, every, for every dollar that you donate, a dollar will be matched to that, uh, to your dollar. So I wanted to get those two things in. So our speaker today is Dr. Stephen Shearer. Stephen is, Dr. Shearer is the Vice Chair of the Academic Development, Vice Chair of Academic Development in the Department of Neurology at Penn Medicine. And he is also the Clinical Director of the CMTA Center of Excellence at Penn and he sits on the CMTA's Scientific Advisory Board. And he is also my neurologist and a couple other people's neurologists here I know, and, uh, and a really good guy, an all-around good egg. So I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Shearer. Welcome. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. All right. So I'm going to tell you that the meeting today is recorded, so please don't divulge any personal medical information or that would not be good. You know, I've made every attempt. I know how to be HIPAA compliant these days, and so we want to not share our 
stories beyond what the CMT facts are. Um, I think I have to share my screen, so let me do that. This is it. Somebody, you know, Clark, you have to let me share my screen. I just made you a co-host here, so you should be okay. You want to try again? I will try again. That looks like it's going to work. And let me open my talk. Can you see the talk there coming up? Yes. Yeah, okay, and I'm gonna make it the full screen then. I mean, in theirs. All right, are we still good? We're good. Yes. And then okay. we might just ask that everyone go ahead and mute themselves while Dr. Shear is presenting, please. If you haven't already muted, please go ahead and do so. Well, this is my first virtual presentation and it's interesting. I've given a lot of Zoom meetings in the last six months, but never have I given a talk. So if things don't go according to plan, please apologize. My iTunes has a bad habit of popping in. And so if you hear Ayala singing, I'll try to quickly turn it off, but uh, it, it happens. I don't know what the bug is. So my goal here today is to do a pretty broad overview of CMT, focusing on the four most common types. And along the way, I'm going to emphasize unapologetically of the role that the CMT Association has played in multiple facets of the work that's gone on in this field. The CMPA has been the most important supporter, besides the NIH itself, of what has happened in CMT research, especially towards an goal of having a treatment that helps people with have, who have CMT. That said, all right, so I can't advance my slides. I don't know what happened there. Let me click on the arrow down. Here. Yeah, try the arrow at the bottom. Yeah. Um, as far as I know, I don't have any financial interest in this presentation. I, will, I must say that if gene therapy for CMT happens, it will perhaps involve one of my colleagues at Pennsylvania, University of Pennsylvania, Jim Wilson. And so if it benefits the University of Pennsylvania, it indirectly benefits me. But that would be a happy conflict because that means we have a treatment that works. So this is the most important slide in the talk. And, and the reason it, it's the most important slide is it, it emphasizes the fact that there's a partnership between the people who have CMT, which are most of the people on this call, and people like me who have an interest in figuring out what goes wrong to cause their CMT, try to find out why the gene defect causes something to go wrong to cause CMT. And based on that, what we're gonna call in the future a target, you know, what goes wrong is the target of therapy. We'll intend to have a treatment that fixes that problem such that we would have a treatment for the patients who actually have CMT. This is the goal, this has been the goal forever. And I think you'll see that we're making progress at getting to the goal as we go along here. And the picture of these two young people that I'm showing were former members of my lab. Um, and that's to say that the work that happens only happens because of the involvement of people like me and their students and staff because you know, I'm just the mouthpiece for all the work that goes on in my lab. The people that actually do the work are people who aren't me. So to get things started, let's talk about what Charcot-Marie Tooth is. And so we get our definition straight. So it's basically just a name, even an acronym for Charcot-Marie and Tooth, who were the first people to accurately describe what hereditary neuropathy is. And that was well more than a hundred years ago. And of course, now we have almost an alphabet soup of vocabulary words that are impossible to learn until you've been in it for a while, which is basically an attempt of people like me to subdivide all the different kinds of CMP that have been discovered over the past 100 years. And this slide is not to intimidate us, but rather just to say that we have to speak carefully and accurately about what these names mean because they are the names that one or more of you have been given for the cause of their neuropathy. And it's not to confuse us about things, but rather I hope as the talk goes on, I can simplify these down to what they actually mean. So the way that somebody gets diagnosed with CMT starts off with the facts of that person's life and their health. And so 
if you come from a family that has dominantly inherited CMT, then your mom or dad probably had it, and then you got it. And so people okay. know that there's something going on in the family, and therefore okay. they're on their, you know, very attentive toes when their child is born and developing, do they have what I have? And so the history and other affected family members are a strong indication that the diagnosis is going to be an inherited neuropathy, therefore CMT, and not some other cause of neuropathy, of which there are many. And this problem is actually quite real if you have an adult onset CMT, which is a question that comes up later in the talk that was asked of me via Clark. So this, this drawing shows in, in age the prevalence of neuropathy in the county in which the Mayo Clinic is located in Minnesota. And you can see that neuropathy is very uncommon until the age of, I'm going to say, 30 to 40. But after the age of 40, it increases dramatically. Now, not all of these people have a CMT, but actually some of them do. And the only people that were really knowledgeable about what you should suspect CMT are the people who are under the age of 40, who have a family history, we'll add that on. And when we get to the, what the nerve conductions are, have a demyelinating neuropathy. So if you have a demyelinating neuropathy that started under the age of 40, we can be in a family history, we know that that person has an inherited neuropathy. And in fact, for that person, we can almost always figure out the cause if it's a demyelinating neuropathy under the age of 40. Where we get, unfortunately, not so good at diagnosing neuropathy is after the age of 40, a neuropathy that isn't demyelinating, and I'll explain what that means later, what we'll call it exonal. This, the people on this part of the curve, that can be very problematic to know whether it's CMT or not. And so there's a question that comes up later that is exactly this point. It's like, how do we know when somebody has an neuropathy begin at the age of 50, whether that person has CMT or not? So there's no easy answer to that. And most people who fit that description don't get a diagnosis at a genetic level today. So the other way that we can be confident that somebody has neuropathy and therefore perhaps has CMT is we can examine them. And so what do you do? You come in and visit somebody like me. I take a history. I measure your strength by just, you know, wrestling with you. I use my reflex hammer, my tuning fork, and these little funny pins to figure out whether you have neuropathy. And so if I did that correctly, I'm gonna be able to come up with an idea that you're weak in a distribution that makes sense to me, and I'll show you a picture in a minute, that you have decreased sensation, and that sort of comes in three flavors. Your reflexes are a form of sensation, so if you lose your reflexes, that's an indication that you have neuropathy. If you can't feel the tuning fork on your toes and your ankles, then that's an indication that you have a neuropathy. And if you can't feel pinprick and temperature properly in your distal extremities, hands and feet, then that's an indication you have neuropathy. And actually all of these different attributes reflect different populations of nerve fibers in your nerves. So here's a picture of a man who has CMTX. He has pretty pronounced where the arrows are loss of muscle bulk in his hands. And so that's a pretty common finding in somebody who has a moderate to severe neuropathy. And Muscle loss of bulk means that obviously there's going to be weakness in those muscles. And so that's a physical finding that lets you know that somebody has neuropathy. And that brings us to our first question. So I think you can read it, but the important point is, is that anabolic steroids, which if you were an athlete and took and were lifting weights, could enhance your muscle bulk, those you would wonder, could they help somebody who has CMT? Well, so the answer is no. If you're not an athlete who's working out regularly and taking anabolic steroids, uh, they're not going to help you. So if you were basically a couch potato and you took anabolic steroids, you would get no obvious increase in your muscle bulk. You have to exercise to sort of gain that increase. But the problem with CMT is that the reason that you lost mu muscle bulk to your hand muscles is you've lost the motor nerve fibers that should innervate those muscles and make them work. And so you can't make muscle bulk appear if the motor nerve fibers that are going to this muscle are actually working. So if they're not working, taking steroids that would otherwise help somebody who works out, it's not gonna help. So unfortunately, 
antibiotic steroids aren't a real solution here. So this is a cartoon of somebody's sensory loss to give you an idea. If I took the pinprick to somebody who has really severe neuropathy, it'd be perhaps they couldn't feel the pinprick at all in their lower legs. They'd start to feel it in their upper thighs and they wouldn't feel it till you got up to, you know, somewhere above the elbow. And so this would be an idea that you're losing the function of your sensory nerve fibers. And what's the pattern here? The pattern is, is that the longer the nerve fiber is, so from here to here is the longest one, the more effective it's going to be. And it also means the neuropathy started in the feet and then progressed up the legs. And I think everybody on this call who has CMT probably appreciates that, that the first sensory stuff that they noticed was in their feet. But as time goes on, that sensation of whatever abnormality was going on went up and up and up their legs. And so that sort of means that the little Pac-Man in your body is eating the nerve endings starting in the toes, but then progressing up the legs and leaving you as a result, feeling less and less over time and higher and higher up the legs. And then superimposed on this process, particularly for some kinds of CMT, is the problem of nerve pain. So nerve pain, I would tell you, means that the nerve fibers that are normally in our bodies to tell the brain about pain that's going on, when they're attacked by the CMT, they generate abnormal electrical impulses that sort of fools the brain into thinking bad things are going on. And then this is a cartoon or a picture actually of a patient of mine who stood on a Xerox machine and then colored in where he feels the pain in his feet. So the orange colored parts of his feet is where he has constant burning pain and the little pink electrical zap things are where he has these zapping electrical shocks of pain, which is probably the two most common kinds of descriptors that, that people have of pain. Perhaps the third would be like the feet are tightly enveloped by something that's too tightly fitting and making their feet uncomfortable. So nerve pain is a real issue. It comes from the damage of the smallest nerve fibers. There are treatments for nerve pain that are too numerous to mention on this call, but the bottom line is, is that there are four or five classes of drugs that work for nerve pain, and that if you start with the ones that work most commonly and increase the dose, maybe you'll find significant relief from the nerve pain, but it's a trial and error sort of thing, working with medications and giving each medication a chance of working before abandoning it. And if you find one that works and it's like blackjack, you stick with it. So if there are more questions about that, we'll, we'll deal with that later, but that's the idea. So here's three questions that came up, I think from the same person about nerve pain and, and different approaches to it. So, Besides the five medications that I've mentioned, there are, of course, many advertisements. If you Google neuropathy pain, you're going to come up first with a sponsored website from A to Z talking about things that people promote for nerve pain. So natural products, as far as I know, haven't been shown to be very effective for nerve pain. So CBD is a product from cannabis, is something that doesn't make you high but has definite effects in the brain. I have had patients and everybody who practices has had patients who have tried CBD oil for nerve pain, either topically or ingested. And here and there, somebody thinks that it helps them. So I'm not gonna dispute if somebody thinks that it helps them, then I accept that out of hand. It's never been studied rigorously such that 100 people with nerve pain got CBD and 100 people got something that was placebo control, and then you compared who got better over time in terms of their nerve pain. So it's never been studied like that. So to say that it's been rigorously vetted in the way that a scientist would like it to see vetted, it's not been done, so I can't swear to you that it works. Maybe it does for some people, and that's probably as much as you can say about it today. Other natural products have been even less I think, studied for pain. And people like to think that vitamins help nerve pain. And who's to say that that's not true? I've just not never been impressed that taking vitamins is a good idea for nerve pain. And 
some people have taken vitamin B6 in excessive amounts and actually caused neuropathy. Instead of making the neuropathy better, they actually made the neuropathy worse because too much B6 actually causes neuropathy. So don't do that. And then this nerve growth factor drug that's in development for arthritis pain, you know, I haven't read one way or the other that it helps nerve pain. So I'll leave that as an unanswered question. The original concept was is that people gave nerve growth factor, which is a natural product that the body makes, a natural peptide in a body. And what they noticed is that there was increased pain at the injection site. So they were giving it for people who had neuropathy in one study, and there was increased pain in the injection site, which sort of makes sense biologically. So then when people developed an antibody that blocks nerve growth factor, they thought that maybe that would block the pain that nerve growth factor might produce. And so that's been used in, I think, arthritis of the knee, and it might actually work, but then there were these unexpected, acutely worsened knee failures that require knee replacement. So I think that the trial was halted at that point. I, that, that's the best that I can recall at, at this point in time. I didn't go reread all those studies for today's talk. Okay, so we've got this far. So we know that the history and clinical exam matter, and then there's this issue of what nerve conductions add to that. And so the basic bottom line to nerve conductions is that they help you in two ways. They give you an idea of how severe the neuropathy is, and I'll show you an example of that as we go forward. And they also tell you whether this conduction velocity is normal, like 50 meters a second, or is it too slow, which sort of tells you it's a demyelinating neuropathy. And why is that useful? Well, and this is just the EMG tech at Penn's arm showing you what you all remember about getting your nerve conduction done. So they help you tell whether the neuropathy is demyelinating. And so we're gonna build you a couple of Venn diagrams here where here's somebody who has motor involvement only, here's somebody that has sensory involvement only. People with CNT typically have both motor and sensory involvement. And there are many genes that make this picture happen. And the nerve conductions tell you whether the neuropathy is demyelinating or not. If they're 38 meters a second or faster, then it's probably an axonal problem. And that's important for a reason I'll show you in a minute. And if they're slower than that, then it's probably a myelin problem. And that means it's a different cell that needs to be fixed when we come to talking about fixing things. And so the reason for doing nerve conductions in a diagnostic sense is it tells you what kind of CMT you're after. And this is particularly important if, if you do genetic testing and you get a result and you're trying to figure out whether that gene result makes sense, it should agree fundamentally with what is known about that particular flavor of CMT. So if you found a gene, genetic variant that causes a demyelinating neuropathy, and that's what you would expect to see, and it was a novel variant, we'll, we'll argue, then you would sort of believe that that was the cause of the neuropathy. But if it didn't fit that consistent picture, then you might take a pause and say, maybe that isn't really the cause of that patient's neuropathy. So here's a question that comes up in this vein. We can read it together. So one patient says they were diagnosed with CMT2 and his sister was diagnosed with CMT1. And would it be reasonable to think that both people could have the same G effect and have different kinds of CMT. And I think the answer to this question is no. I think if you and your sister have CMT, you likely have the same genetic cause. And without knowing the exact data, what was found on the nerve conductions, I can't speak to this more precisely, but you, I would have a hard time believing that there isn't one cause of CMT and that the difference isn't maybe one person has a conduction of 38 meters a second, the other person had a conduction of 30 meters a second, and you're sort of splitting hairs to call it CMT1 or CMT2. But if this person who's asking the question wants to come back to me by email and give me the facts, what would actually be required is I'd have to know the exact numbers, which nerves were studied and what the exact conduction velocities were to have any insight as to how to resolve this controversy. And so now we're to the point of doing genetic testing. So we know the history, the clinical exam, the nerve connections, we sort of know how those help us. And then genetic testing 
basically means we're going to go find the gene that causes the neuropathy. And so I've already shown you these, that there are many genes. And so the facts are, is as of this year, there's more than 100 genes that cause CMT. That's a lot of genes. So how do we sort of deal with that? I'm going to hold this question for one second. And so basically, if you look at the largest group of patients who have CMT that have ever been sort of collected together and the causes look for genetically by DNA testing, what you can come away with is that, is that their most patients have CMT1. That's the demyelinating form of CMT. Most people on this call have CMT1. And in this other part of the pie chart is CMT2 and CMTX and everything else thrown in, but there's really four common kinds of CMT, which I'll show you in a second. Now I'll go back to our question. So my neurologist diagnosed me with CMT at age 55. It's probably type two because that would be the common kind that presents that age 55, and that just means that the conductions weren't slowed. And this person also had a whole exome sequencing performed. That means they sequenced all 20,000 genes that are known to exist in humans, and the computer couldn't find a DNA variant in a known cause of CMT to blame the CMT on. So this person's already had probably the most definitive test that can be done to date for finding the cause of CMT and no answer has been found. So it's a problem. We, as I told you in that earlier slide, we just don't do very well at figuring out the causes of adult onset CMT. And so one can't give good advice as to whether this neuropathy is CMT of an unknown cause or, or what. And so the risk that you could tell that person about their son or daughter having CMT isn't very good. You couldn't say one way or the other whether it's dominantly inherited. So if the risk to their son or daughter would be 50% a piece if it was dominantly inherited, but we don't know that for a fact. Testing your son or daughter genetically wouldn't actually help either because they're not manifesting neuropathy. So it doesn't really help you figure this out. So this is a very common scenario. I have a couple hundred patients who I think in my heart of hearts have CMT type two, where genetic testing hasn't revealed the answer. And my experience is quite the same as every other neurologist who does this. So for the remainder of the talk, I'd like to focus on the four commonest types of CMT what we know about them and what in particular we think we might be able to do to fix them. So here they're listed by name. There's 1A, 1B, 2A, and 1X. And here's what cell we want to blame for causing the problem. And I'll show you in a second why that's important. So Another way of showing this pictorially is that CM1A and sort of a counterpart that we're not going to talk much about today, hereditary neuropathy with liability to pressure palsy. Those are the two most common. They're the biggest. These other ones are about 10% of CMT apiece. And then all the other causes all together, including ones that we don't even know the name of, are, are that size. So they're about as common as X and 2A combined. So we'll say 40% at most is unknown. So how are we going to fix CMT? Well, the first thing I have to tell you is what nerves are and, and how we think about them. So the picture that I have on the left is basically a cable with many different kinds of wires in it. And if you were to follow the logic of what I said earlier about the different kinds of sensations that we have and the fact that motor fibers are different than sensory fibers, then we could just imagine nerves are collection of different kinds of nerve fibers, which in real life look sort of more like this, big, big nerve fibers and little nerve fibers. And CMT affects pretty much all of them, sensory and motor. 
And in real life, this is a picture of a real human nerve. We can see that that's what they look like. Here is a big nerve fiber with its dark myelin sheath. Here's a little nerve fiber with its dark myelin sheath. And how do we, why do we need to know that? So this is a cartoon that shows the spinal cord, one nerve fiber start, the cell body lives in the spinal cord. Its axon goes all the way down to a muscle where it makes the muscle work. Not shown here is a sensory ganglia. Just pictured there's a sensory nerve fiber, sensory nerve body in here and a nerve fiber that goes down, but in this case goes to the muscle to the skin. So the nerves are a mixture of motor and sensory nerve fibers. And each of the large nerve fibers is coated by these little blue things, the myelin sheaths. So I'm gonna show you examples again and again of what I mean by, is it a myelin problem or an axon problem? So for CMT2A, the problem is, is that there's a gene that's not working in the motor and the sensory nerve cells such that their axons become compromised over time and degenerate so that the motor nerve fibers don't connect to the muscle and the sensory nerve fibers don't connect to whatever part of the body they're connected to. And if you lose those axons over time, you're going to get weak and numb. And if it's a myelin problem, which would be CMT1A, CMT1B, and CMTX, then these individual Schwann cells and their myelin sheaths aren't working. And so they compromise the function of the nerve fiber over time such that the nerve fibers just don't work properly and you get a neuropathy. So fixing the cell bodies in the spinal cord and dorsal ganglia and fixing the Schwann cells all along the nerves, that's the way to conceptualize what scientists need to come up with to fix peripheral neuropathy. So starting with CMT1A, we'll say again that it's the commonest cause of CMT. About half the people who have CMT have this. We know it's a dominantly inherited disease with new mutations about 10% of the time. And the problem is, is that there's just too much PMP22. This is the, what the gene encodes. There's a duplication of the gene. I'll show you a cartoon in a second. And too much of a good thing is a bad thing. And you get demyelination as a result. There are mouse and rat models of CMT1A, which are really important in terms of evaluating candidate therapies for CMT1A. And the goal of most approaches is to reduce the amount of PMP22 from too much to just the right amount, or theoretically to counteract the effects of too much PMP22 to accomplish the same thing. And because this is the most common form of CMT, David Herman, was able to secure a grant from the NIH to get us ready to do clinical trials for CMT1A from the NIH. And Penn is one of the sites, as is the University of Rochester and the University of Iowa, for evaluating patients in a more intense way, such that when we have a candidate therapy, we know how we're going to evaluate it in a clinical trial with patients. This is a cartoon that's just meant to show you the problem is, is with CMT1A is one of the chromosomes has two copies of these green things. That's the gene PMP22. Two copies is a duplication. And on the other chromosome, one copy. So three copies of PMP22, this chromosome plus that one, is too much PMP22. That's the fundamental problem. It's been known for 20 years, 30 years now that that's the fundamental problem. And we can sort of fix it in an animal model, but we haven't been able to show that we can fix it in a human model. So what too much PMP22 does, it, it makes the nerve that I showed you before, which is, this is a normal nerve, it makes it look like this, which is you've lost a lot of these myelinated axons. So the demyelination over time has resulted in the loss of a lot of myelinated axons. So if we had a therapy that worked, the goal would be to treat children whose nerves still look like this and prevent them from losing axons and looking like that. And if we were able to do that, I think logically the people wouldn't become any weaker and they wouldn't get any number and it would stabilize the disease where it stood. And so we're actually able to do that in a rat and a mouse model of CMT1A very effectively with ASOs. This was a, a study that was done by Ionis the problem is, is that the dose of oligonucleotides that was required to do that is too toxic to give to humans. And so we're sort of stuck on a better way of delivering them. And 
if that could be accomplished, then I would be very enthusiastic about seeing that going forward in clinical trial on people. So I put this question in here. I could have put it in earlier, but this is, this is a study that was done where we were trying to treat patients' weakness by injecting a drug directly into a weak muscle and to improve its strength. And the, and the trial was stopped because although they could show that the mass of the muscle improved and perhaps even a little bit of improvement in strength, it wasn't considered significant enough to carry the work forward. And at least one person on this call was involved in that trial. And so perhaps they would speak to this later. I don't think there were too many problems with administering the drug itself, uh, but it was stopped. There's no way to prescribe a drug. It's, it's not being made and delivered to anybody. I think that there was a compassionate use clause that people who were on the drug could get it for another year, but at the end of that, it's, it's all gone. So I think my, and we've heard from the person who ran this clinical trial that basically was stopped because they just didn't get enough bang for their buck and they didn't think they were gonna go anywhere with it. And to say more beyond that, I, I just don't know what the answer would be. I don't think this approach is entirely uh, abandoned, but this particular injected form of it has, for the time being, not, it's not going to go forward. So the next most common kind of CMT is CMTX. So we're, we know that mutations in a gene that makes a gap junction protein called connection 32 is the cause of this. It's X-linked, and I'll show you how that looks in a second. The mechanism of the disease, I would say, is uncertain. I think it's very attractive to think that the result of this mutation is that axons get starved of their essential nutrients because the loss of function of this gap junction protein results in that being the case. The therapeutic options for treating this include gene replacement. I'm pretty sure that that's a logical approach. And there's also the idea that inflammation contributes to the disease severity. And that's both of those are ongoing works that have been supported by the CMTA over time. And those are still the best approaches that I know of to treat this disease. There are new animal models that have been created with the support of the CMTA, which are gonna be very important to evaluate therapies going forward. And the CMTA has funded sort of a, clin a, a clinical trial readiness grant such we can evaluate people who have CMTX with the same methodologies that we're using to evaluate people with CMT1A. And so that just means that if we were to have a treatment that was ready to go into people, we would have the most sophisticated approach of evaluating them that we could come up with at this time. So I alluded to this. So these, this is a cartoon that shows four of the 500 different causes of CMTX. And what this means is that all these little blue balls all around represent the different kinds of mutations that cause CMTX. Pretty much every family has their own mutation. Uh, there are a few repeat mutations on this list, but most of these mutations are unique and described in single families. And so Altogether, what I have to think is each of these mutations results in the loss of this protein to do what it's supposed to do in the myelinating Schwann cell. And so gene replacement should work for all of these mutations. And that, that's my hunch going forward. And so one therapy might prove to be effective regardless of the mutation in this case. This is what a nerve looks like in CMTX. This is a person who was 60 years old who had CMTX for his whole life. And what we're again trying to do is prevent the nerve from losing its myelinated axons and keeping it looking young and healthy. And again, I think the idea would be if we develop an effective therapy, the earlier we give it to people, Dr. Sure, did we lose you? Is it for downstairs? I think we lost Dr. Shear. 
Clark, are you seeing him? Uh, I see a frozen picture. That's okay. all. Yeah, I think. Let's give, oh, we may have lost him and he will probably come back on. Oh, there he is. I see Clark, did you lose me? Yes, we, for uh, you. maybe a minute. All right, where did you lose me at? Um, you were saying that uh, each family represented a different uh, mutation, probably. I think I need you to go offline. And I think the, you'll have to reshare your slides, Dr. Shear. Sorry, there they went All away. Right. As well, I'm going. I'm going. I'm no going to blame my son who logged into our network, and maybe I just lost <laughs> my bandwidth. When in doubt, blame the kids. All right. All right. So I'm going to hit share screen. Yes. And I'll give you my phone number. You can call me if this happens again. It might be the easiest way. But maybe I don't have my phone sitting there. But yeah, I do. So it's 610-368-3597. All right. Thank you. Uh, that will be fine. All right. So where am I going here? Can you see me now? Nope. Did you? Oh, uh, yes. It's coming on. We are seeing your presentation. All right, so I'm going to go back. I apologize. So that slide? Um, yeah, I think we were right there. Let's yep. See. Uh, so, so this is saying that there are many, many mutations that cause X. Pretty much every family has their own mutation. And we think that fixing the that the gene just doesn't work, the protein just doesn't work, and we can fix all of these mutations, regardless of which ones they are, with the same approach. So that's, that, that was the important point. And so gene replacement strategies or reducing the inflammation we think would work for all the different causes of X. And the goal is to prevent the nerve from going from looking normal to looking like it's lost myelinated nerve fibers. And again, the earlier that we would initiate that therapy, the better, because the disease gets worse over time, the axonal loss gets worse over time. And then moving on to CMT2A, this is caused by mutations in a different gene, mitofusin 2. It affects mitochondria, which I'll show you a cartoon of, but it's a little bit tricky to explain what it does because we're not quite sure, but the mitofusin 2 mutation is known to have a role in mitochondria. And we think that if we could replace the defective gene, that that would be a, a solution for all the mutations of mitofusin 2 that cause CMT2A. That could be done in a couple of different ways, including gene therapy, but other approaches more theoretically uh, popular like gene editing or if we had a way of counteracting the effect of the gene defect, which is a problem that Gerald Dorn is working on. The CMT Association has created an authentic rat model of this disease, which is hugely important because we can evaluate any candidate therapy in an animal model before giving it to people and show whether or not it works. And the CMT is supporting the acquisition of data about, from patients who have CMT1A, or sorry, 2A, in order to know if we had a clinical trial, what would we measure to know whether the clinical, whether the, the approach was working? So this cartoon shows you mitofusin 2 as a protein that tethers together two mitochondria, and that's what it's thought to do. Here are just some of the mutations that are known to cause neuropathy in humans, and the two that are underlined in red are the ones that we made in a rat model. And basically this slide shows you the nerve on the right comes from one of the rats that has one of these mutations. And there's a loss of the myelinated fibers that I think your eye can tell you this is the normal. And this is the animal that has CMT2A. And you see that you're losing myelinated fibers and the animal's basically six months old. So that's cool. But what's even cooler in an animal model is you can watch this happen over time. You can do nerve conductions on a rat tail, believe it or not. And you can show that the size of the response, which should normally go bigger, bigger, bigger over time, actually reaches a peak and then falls. So even with just in the same cohort of animals, you can basically determine whether a treatment works. 
So last but not least is CMT1B. This is caused by mutations in myelin protein zero. There are many mutations in this gene that cause it. We think that all of them could be treated with some of the same approaches, either replace the defective gene, edit the mutation back to normal, or figure out a way to counteract the effect of the gene defect. And the thing that I won't explain today is there's something called the unfurled protein response. And we think that that has some untoward effects that could be manipulated to a therapeutic end in CMT1B. The CMT1A has funded the creation of one of the animal models of 1B, and the CMTA has supported a clinical trial to acquire, again, the natural history from patients with 1B, such that if we had a therapy that was gonna go into people, we would know what to measure to see if the therapy worked. This is but just a few of the mutations in myelin protein zero to give you an idea. Again, it's very diverse. And then the last point that we're gonna come back to is that we have many patients and some patients perhaps on this call who have CMT, mostly it's gonna be adult onset axonal neuropathies where we just don't know the gene defect. And at this point, if we don't know the gene defect, we don't really have a logical way of treating what goes wrong. If it could be true that there would be a treatment for all neuropathies, then maybe that would be a treatment for all people with CMT, but we're not there yet. So I showed a version of this slide before, and this is just to show you that there are many genes that we already know of, which have a neuropathy that begins after the age of 40, and so it's not without known causes that we say this, but we just, we don't do very well at figuring out the cause of neuropathy after the age of 30 or 40. And that's work that the CMTA has funded and that's being carried out at many of the centers that are the CMT centers of excellence. And so basically this is an outdated slide. I'd look for my newer version, but I couldn't find it. But there are, you know, the principal sites would be Stephen Sabrina in Philadelphia, David Herman, Rochester, Rick Finkel has now moved to Nashville, Mike Scheib, University of Iowa. We see a lot of patients with CMT. Baltimore has a site as well. And we're basically the people that are gonna have the best shot on goal of figuring out the genetic cause of CMT because we spend much of our professional lives thinking about this problem to the exclusion of other things in neurology. We're also the sites, Rochester, Iowa and Penn, we're doing this intense natural history study, 1A, 1B, 1X, and 2A. Um, so if you had those kinds of rough and you wanted to be participatory, you'd have to go to one of these four sites. So this brings us to, I think, perhaps my last question, which is a fair complaint, which is basically outside of the places where there's a CMT expert at a university hospital, you're not gonna find a lot of neurologists who know about CMT. And certainly you're not gonna find hardly anybody outside of neurologists who know what CMT is and, and the issues related to it. I don't have an answer for what to do about that. I give lectures to the residents, the residents coming from Penn, God help me if they don't know what CMT is and would at least have a, a good shot on goal as to figuring out what kind you would have if it was one of the common kinds and referring them if it wasn't one of the kinds they know, I still get a lot of referrals from other neurologists in the area, so that's how it's supposed to work. Whether this problem ever gets solved, I don't know. The CMTA probably has even the larger role to play, which is it, it serves as a clearinghouse for information, like this talk's gonna be recorded and available to people anywhere. And making this information happen should be possible with in the age of the internet better than relying on people like me to educate their local cohort of neurologists and medical students. It's a mountain to climb and I'm on the journey with you, but I don't know how high the mountain is. So I'm going to emphasize some optimistic things here. So I've drug you through a lot of stuff and I don't know how to approach CMT, but by telling you what I know about it. But the thing that I'm the most optimistic about is gene therapy at the moment. I think that 
story I want to show, share with you now is basically how gene therapy has gone from a wish to a reality for at least one neurological disease that's very closely related to CMT. And if we could believe for a minute that the approach will work in CMT, it, it would make sense that it might. And so here's how the story begins. So there is a disease called spinal muscular atrophy, which is basically a, a disease where the motor neurons in the spinal cord are, their axons get disconnected from the muscles of the body such that the babies that are born with this suffer progressive weakness, just like somebody with CMT, but at a, at a beginning at the day of birth and perhaps even before the day of birth and continuing for their brief life of one or two years. So a tragic, terrible, as bad as it gets neurologic disease that until they came up with some therapies, we would have just cried with the parents and not had anything to do. But as it turns out, you can give a vector called AV9 that contains the gene that's missing in these kids and prevent that from happening. So these kids basically get, not only don't deteriorate after you give them their injection, they even get improved over time. So here's a case where gene therapy works published in the famous New England Journal of Medicine. And it showed us that you could give this gene even in the bloodstream, IV, and it could get into the neurons that needed it, the motor neurons from the spinal cord and prevent the disease from progressing. So that was a hugest step ever in gene therapy for neurological disease. There is a clinical trial at the NIH that's basically trying to do the same thing for a disease called giant axonal neuropathy, which is really CMT plus some other brain defects. And we know that it's recessive and the gene that's missing is called giant axonal neuropathy. And so they're giving the gene via spinal tap. So here's a picture of the human brain and spinal cord. They're injecting a needle into the space down here by the spinal cord, injecting the virus there, and the virus can circulate up and down the spinal fluid and infect the motor neurons and the sensory neurons and replace the missing gene and hopefully work. So there have been no published results, but as far as I've heard, there weren't any problems in doing this therapy whether it works or not is a different matter. So there we go, we, we have proven therapy with gene therapy given intravenously to kids with spinal muscular atrophy. We know we can give it intrathecally into people without adverse effects. And so why not think we could give it for axonal forms of CMT? And so what that means is for CMT 2A, but, but many other forms of CMT2 and many recessive forms, the problem is, is that the sensory neurons that live out here in the ganglia and the motor neurons that live here in the spinal cord that I showed you in that cartoon many slides ago, they need a missing gene. And you can give that gene via viral vector into the spinal fluid. They can infect the motor and sensory neurons. And if that gene replacement strategy were enough, that could be a treatment for that form of CMT. So we are collaborating. That is, the CMTA is collaborating. They've shared their CMT2A rat with the Wilson lab at Penn, and there's going to be a treatment for CMT2A in that rat to see if we can make the rat not get CMT2A. And I showed you this cartoon, or sorry, this data that said we can measure in the same rats the amplitude of the sensory response to the tail over time. We can look at the nerves when we kill the animals. And we can, I think, pretty readily determine whether the therapy works. So if the therapy works in a rat model and the gene vector AV9 is safe, I would not be surprised to see a gene trial of CMT2A going forward in the next couple of years. So that's my wish. And then I can retire from CMT because I will have done my lifelong goal of lifetime goal of having a, <laughs> having a therapy for CMT. It's even possible that gene therapy could work for demyelinating forms of CMT. And this is work from Cleopas Cleopa, who's intimately involved with the CMT Association. They funded most of this work. And he's basically taken the AAV vector and the lentivirus vector. He's injected it into the spinal fluid of a rat or a mouse model, rather, of CMTX, and shown that if you inject it here, the virus gets in the Schwann cells all along the nerve roots and even into the nerves and makes the nerves better, improves the, the myelination. He's done that for 1X, and he's done that for 
or C, which is a recessive demyelinating neuropathy. And so at least in an animal model, gene therapy can work for the Schwann cells. The virus gets to the Schwann cells, infects them, and replaces the missing gene. The question that nobody knows the answer to is, will that even possibly work in a human where the nerves are so much, so much more longer, you know, 100 times longer than they are in a mouse or a rat. And so I think logically there's going to be a limit to where intrathecal delivery of the virus, fixing the Schwann cells in, let's say, this part of the nervous system won't be, will, well, how, how much benefit that will be to patients is unknown. If you could figure out a way of delivering the virus via intravenous and have it get into all the Schwann cells and, and, and fix the gene defect, then that would be, I think, logically the way to go. So I think this is the last slide. Maybe there's one more slide in my talk. And this is having to do with the fact that there are breathing difficulties. And I don't know the particulars of this patient's comment, but if you get enough weakness in, from CMT such that it affects the diaphragm, that's the main muscle that helps you breathe, then people can get into compromised breathing situations. And it's pretty common for people to need CPAP at night, even without CMT, but with CMT, they can get into trouble such that they need CPAP at night. And an occasional patient needs pretty much constant ven ventilation support. Um, that's pretty rare. I mean, I think I, out of the hundreds of patients I have, I have maybe two that need that kind of care, where they need even daytime respiratory support. So not sure what all of the answers are here, but my anybody that has this issue needs to see a pulmonologist, a lung specialist, who knows how to evaluate what's, you know, what what the lung function is and how it's not correct, and provide advice as to how to fix it. I don't think the advice should be coming from somebody like me, a neurologist, as to what the solutions are here. But we have a pulmonologist at Penn, and I'm sure every major hospital has a pulmonologist who knows about neuromuscular diseases and can provide some advice on this point. And so I think that's it. It's my last slide. I thank you for having Welcome and ready for any other questions or whatever Laurel and has in mind for me, let's do it. That was phenomenal. I have a follow-up question. Phenomenal. Please. So you said that nerve pain was most prevalent in certain types of CMT. What types are those? Well, the famous ones are called hereditary sensory and autonomic neuropathy, which is mostly a sensory kind of CMT where the sensory nerve endings are affected. It's mostly axonal forms. So People with CMT1A, for instance, have pain, and then you have to decide how much of that is orthopedic complications of their CMT, like arthritis at various joints, and then especially in the ankles, and how much is nerve pain, which is like the burning pressure type of pain. And, and I would say a third of patients with 1A have nerve pain, but not the majority. Most people with 1A have arthritis pain, but it's not nerve pain. So, you know, the myelinating forms of CMT typically don't cause it, axonal typically do cause it. And doesn't matter what the, you know, if you have it, you have it, and then you go from there. Okay. If you have a question for Dr. Shear, if you wanna raise your, your hand and we can just take turns going around. I know we included a, most of the questions um, prior to the meeting so that he could have those in advance. Um, but if, as you've watched the amazing presentation, if questions have come to mind, please feel free to unmute yourself and we'll get those questions answered. Iris, do you wanna unmute yourself and ask your question? Hi, Dr. Scherer. Are you still looking for candidates for the clinical trial that's in the three different locations? So at Penn, we, are, we don't need any more people for 1A, I think. We okay. have a 
I think I have enough people with 1A, but okay. for 1B, 1X, and certainly 2A, I think we are still recruiting. Mm -hmm. So you don't, don't, don't divulge what kind you have, but if, you know, no. the yeah. answer would be if you have anything but 1A, then it's certainly happily see you. There's a commitment on the, on the part of people who join us on every six month sort of visit and it takes most of the day. So it's not yes. a small commitment on patients' right. part. Does it, do you need more people in certain age groups? It said in the, um, in the form, it said you're looking for people from like a young age, like in their 20s, all the way to age 75. So does it matter yeah. what span of, pe you know, what age groups you still require or not? So the clinical coordinator that I have uh, is Dragan Bojovic. Mm -hmm. You can email me or him and okay. offer yourself up as a potential patient and we'll certainly, you know, okay. consider it. We okay. may be full. I just have to say it out loud. Okay. We're on the verge of filling up and I don't want to overcommit and then not be able to deliver. But I appreciate your offer. Okay. Thank you. I'll, I will email him. Yeah, we have, if you don't have his email, I have his email address and we can get that to you. It's also listed on the Center of Excellence page under UPenn and Dr. Shear um, is, is the clinical coordinator. Thank you. Good question. Barry, go ahead. Do you Any want other questions? I think I probably put everyone to sleep. I apologize for that. <laughs> no, I think it's because Good you were so thorough. They actually got their questions answered. Yeah, uh, Dr. Shearer, uh, you had mentioned that there are four categories of drugs that uh, are uh, used or approved for uh, the neuropathic pain. Can you, you just uh, summarize uh, you know, what, what, what those are and mention some of the names? For yes. yes, so the, the, the three categories that I have the most confidence in would be first, the gabapentin, and pre that is Neurontin Lyrica. Those would be the brand names. That's a category. Those two are the only members of it. The other category, the second category, Cyclix, which would be nortriptyline, amitriptyline, dezipramine. Uh, I don't remember their brand names off the top of my head. Amalar is one of them. Uh, uh, so those are classic classically used for treating neurine. They're a little bit different in that they take a couple of weeks to work. They have a bit more side effect profile that's problematic to deal with than do the Neurontin and Pregabalin category, which are, I think, more easily tolerated. The third group would be the so-called mixed serotonin norepinephrine uptake inhibitors. And the one that got approval for treating diabetic painful neuropathy is called Cymbalta or Duloxetine. Another one in that group is called Effexor. So those also work for nerve pain. Um, the other two categories which are probably less useful for nerve pain would be the opiates. And the fourth, or the, sorry, the fifth would be the sodium channel blocker, which theoretically ought to work, but no one has been able to come up with uh, a good drug in that group. And in spite of long drug company efforts to find select blockers for the pain channel. So in the future, the, the blockers of a gene or protein called AV one point channel that might be the best treatment for neuropathy pain of all, but no company, in spite of pretty intense efforts, has got one on the market. Very good information. That pain comes up all the time, that question, all the time. And, and I would, let me, add, let me add to that. So if your pain responds to Motrin, ibuprofen as an example, or Aleve, then that's not nerve pain, because in my experience, those so-called non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, ibuprofen and Aleve, those don't work on nerve pain. So they work on arthritis kind of pain. So if your pain responds to an anti-inflammatory, it's not nerve pain. Great. Barry, go ahead. Yeah, just, uh, uh, there's uh, 
some forms of CMT that uh, uh, are associated with uh, uh, renal problems, auditory problems, can you, uh, and maybe some other uh, organ systems, uh, can you uh, explain how the CMT affects uh, organs other than the nerves, or why there's an association in those types of CMT with other organ systems? So that's a pretty far reaching question. So certain mutations of certain CMT genes for sure cause other issues. And, and then you sort of get into the heart of what CMT, what do you call an inherent neuropathy CMT and when do you call it something else? So in general, people haven't had any problem calling something CMT if the only manifestation is neuropathy. And then the water gets pretty muddied when it's neuropathy plus something else in the same patient most of the time. And sometimes they call that CMT and sometimes they don't. So sticking to this topic as best I can, hearing loss is fairly commonly associated with CMT, but it's only when it's early onset hearing loss and severe and been described multiple times that you can be confident that the CMT is in fact causing it. You know, the same mutations causing the hearing loss. And the way we think about that is that the ears, the hearing, the nerve fibers there are myelinated by Schwann cells just like the rest of our nerves. And so if there's demyelination in your nerves in your hand, there's demyelination in the nerves of your eighth nerve, which is the hearing nerve, and you get hearing loss. Whether that's truly the answer, I don't know, but they, I think it's probably the answer for most of the cases that we know of. So there are point mutations in PMP22 that it's certainly true for. People with CMTX seem to have a disproportionate amount of hearing loss compared to other kinds of CMT. And then there are syndromes where hearing loss is almost always seen, but we usually don't call, call those inherent neuropathy CMT. For other organs, it's pretty uncommon for there to be involvement. I, I don't want to be too obscure, but there are mutations in a gene called IFN2, where you get kidney problems and neuropathy from the mutations, for some of the mutations anyway, and that's a rare form of CMT. And beyond that, I'm blanking on what other famous associations you're thinking of, Barry, but please help me if, if there's one in particular that no, you're... The, the, yeah, the, there are the two that I was uh, uh, thinking of. Good questions. Susan has her hand up. Susan, go ahead. Um, how about the uh, involvement of, of the esophagus? I, I have late onset of unknown type of, and I'm starting to develop some esophagus problems. Um, so may I ask, upper or lower that? esophagus? Say upper, again? The, the, the esophagus has an important distinction. The upper part is controlled by your swallowing act. Here the stomach is sort of involuntary. It doesn't, doesn't really involve the nerves to the same degree. So achalasia is the lower part, so. Um, it, it looks to be, uh, it, this is very new. It's only this last week where I'm having trouble swallowing and it's affecting my uh, larynx and. Right, um, so. I, so and I, I'm, my mother who had um, the CMT started to develop this also in her later years. Um, and I'm wondering if it's CMT related or has anybody studied, you know, uh, the, the involvement that CMT may have on an esophagus? So it's a good question to try to think about. I'm not sure I have enough memorized in my head to answer it fully but swallowing okay. problems can be seen in CMT it's not common it would be decidedly rare and that could be based upon the idea that the nerve fibers that you involve in the swallowing response could be affected by neuropathy certainly laryngeal involvement that is the vocal cords are involved in different kinds of CMT and <clears throat> swallowing is sort of in the same ballpark as that you'd have to 
for this to make sense, however, it'd have to be a pretty bad CMT because the nerve fibers that go to your esophagus aren't very long. They're like this long. And that would mean by the time you'd have those, you'd be profoundly weak in other muscles, almost characteristically. And so unless your CMT is that far along, I wouldn't want to just naturally blame it on the CMT. In any event, you'd want to get it investigated, in my opinion, by getting a swallowing study because they do have ways of classifying swallowing issues based on the actual visualization of a swallowing, the act of swallowing by a special study that they do. You vary them of different consistencies and they can watch how you process that in the back of your throat. What kind of doctor would do that kind of study? Well, at Penn, it's a speech, the ENT group, in conjunction with the radiology group, they sort of have a one person from speech, the speech pathology person, and following radiologists, the GI radiologists, they collaborate. I've had the study myself, so I'm quite familiar with what that oh. involved. So not an ENT necessarily. It's radiologist and an ENT collaboration, I think, if okay. you're going to get it done fully. Okay, thank you. There's two different experts that have way, have, have knowledge on this point. Thank you. That's a great question. Marianne, go ahead. Re somewhat related to that, uh, I've got my husband and uh, several of our children who have CMT1A. And in particular, two of them that also seem to have connective tissue disorders. Um, one of them has a swallowing issue that started in the teens where periodically will um, have trouble swallowing and go up into the, you know, up to the nose and that sort of thing. And then um, the other one has had vocal cord issues where it actually had some therapy that seemed to help with that. Um, they both also had um, pectus carinatum that they had surgically um, corrected. But um, so it's nothing that's life threatening, but there does seem to be a pattern of, of um, you know, other than extremity issues. And also um, one of them is on, uh, has sleep apnea. Uh, I'm not sure quite what my question is, but have you found any connection with connective tissue disorders in any of your CMT patients? Might there be some um, shared uh, gene that has both a mutation in both types of uh, disorders? So for, uh, let's approach your question this way. So if you know the kind of CMT you have, then you're at least in the position of saying, how often have I seen or heard, or has it ever been published that this other issue exists in this form of CMT? So for 1A, which is fairly common, we can sort of answer, I think, your question. Where, where it gets really hard is when somebody doesn't even know that, <coughs> excuse me, the kind of CMT they have, or it's so rare that the clinical experience around that kind of CMT is limited. But for 1A, I think we have a pretty good idea of what has been reported and again, my memory isn't going to be perfect on this point, but I think for connective tissue diseases and CMT1A, no relationship. Uh, for swelling issues, you know, unless the deficit is like permanent, just, you know, if you have seen, I mean, put it this if you have your hand is weak today, it's going to be weak tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that and forever. And so, any issue that's transient that comes and goes and comes and goes is not likely to be your CMT because that's not what CMT is all about. CMT is about nerve fiber loss producing deficits and the deficits, once they're there, aren't going to get better as a rule. So any of those transient symptoms, no matter what they are, and you, if I had a dollar for every time I've been asked a question about some connection, I'd be a rich man by now. I would say no, it, it, it doesn't fit. Skeletal deformities in CMT1A, the ones that are well understood would be scoliosis and hip dysplasia right. and even malformed feet. Um, so there are plenty, they have both plenty those. known about that. Yeah, so I, if pectum excavatum gets added to that list, that wouldn't shock 
It's cured on them, yeah. The Kieran CMT or nerves, and I could, I could, I could ponder that that one might be related because other skeletal problems are known to be associated with CMT1A. Okay, thank you. Good questions. Great. Jane, do you want to go ahead and unmute yourself? Oh. Jane, you have to, Jane, I'm sorry to interrupt you. You'll have to unmute yourself. I can't unmute for you. Do you see the... Here, here is that it? Uh, yes, ma'am. <laughs> is Does atelectasis have any relation to CMT or could it? So atelectasis means that the, the, the tiny air sacs in the lungs aren't fully expanded. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a lung issue. Lung issues could, CMT could cause lung issues. Some kinds of CMT typically do, it depends on the kind, but even 1A, the most common kind, in some patients causes lung issues. So if you're not fully inflating your lungs for whatever reason, and CMT is one of them, mm -hmm. you could have the phenomenon of atelectasis. And so that's a, a pulmonologist should weigh in on how to manage that. But like when you go into the hospital and you have a major surgery and they give you this breathing machine and they want you to breathe in and breathe out, that's the fully yeah. expand your lungs. So it's like exercising your lungs, if you will, I to see. combat the atelectasis. So I would definitely want a pulmonologist to have an opinion about whether they think it's the cause and what management issues, what management approaches could be brought to bear upon it. Thank you. Thank you. Clark, did you have a question? Something happened here to my screen. Where is it? What's we can this? still see you. Can you see me? Yep, we sure I can. can. This disappeared. Let's see, how do I get you back? Lower left corner video. Nope, that's not it. Or you may have to go back to the tab. Well, to the top. You keep trying. We can see you, though. I'm going to mute you, and we're going to go on to the next question. Okay. I can hear you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sure. I'm just curious if the rate of nerve deterioration is steady or if it increases with age. Or do you know? So Clark's asking a question I can't answer. Um, it would probably depend on the kind of CMT. Certainly patients think that they go through dramatic worsenings in certain epochs of their life that, you know, remain unexplained. And for some kinds of CMT, this is pretty well documented that they, the, a whole arm, for instance, there are mutations in a gene called FIG4, recessive mutations of FIG4, where people can lose the function of a limb and never recover it in like a day or a week. So that kind of thing has been reported. Trip V4 is another one where CMT, I think it's 4C or 2C rather, can dramatically worsen and never come back. So yes, it can happen. It's CMT specific types that are known to do it. Whether the common kinds of CMT would have such dramatic worsenings, um, I mentioned HMPP along the way. That's this demyelinating CMT that's very common, but most patients don't even know they have it because it usually doesn't cause them any issue. But when they do know that they have it, they often have a transient palsy of the nerve, like they'll develop a wrist drop or a foot drop or bad carpal tunnel. And that's just from the nerves are sort of abnormally sensitive to pressure. And so just a compression that wouldn't ordinarily cause a problem can cause the nerve to demyelinate locally. And then it stays damaged until the remodelation happens. So there, there are good examples like that, but for 1A, 1B, X, 2A, I'm hard pressed to think that there are well-described dramatic worsenings that I like the ones I just mentioned. In my, I think once the CMP starts, it progresses, I won't say at the same rate, but it's always progressing. 
year to year, whether you're aware of it or not, it's, it's, it's progressing. Does it accelerate with age? I think the data for 1A actually says it, it slows down in terms of its manifestations with age. If you like measure disability over time with, with people with CM2-1A, you acquire most of your disability in your first 20 years of life. Hmm. How about 1B? Ask Mike Shy that question, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna say to a first approximation, it's also gonna be most of the disabilities early. Hmm. There are different forms of 1B, so it's a, that's a trickier question. You know, mm -hmm. some, forms, some people with 1B, as it's called, don't even start their neuropathy until they're after the age of 20. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. I do hear from the community a lot, Dr. Shear, if um, that they're on sort of that slow progressive decline, then they've hit um, an injury or recovered from surgery, which seem to be um, traumatic to their CMT or they felt like it sped up progression. Um, also extreme stress, but that, of course, extreme stress would be harmful to non-CMT years as well, I'm sure. But I do hear about sped up periods of progression. I know, like for me, after each of my pregnancies, that's when my symptoms really kicked in. But I know it's different for everyone. But I think sometimes, I don't know if you've seen this with your, your patient population, um, during a, a trauma to your body or an injury or stress, that there are periods of worsening faster, quickening? So, you know, what you're saying, Laurel, is what I've heard many, many times, and it's, I believe it fully, but our ability to measure it in the same way that you experience it isn't there. So for instance, those yeah. nerve conduction studies that I showed you, or just the, the measurement of disability by strength testing and by pinprick and all that, if you examine somebody who says they're getting worse with all your physical tools and your nerve conduction studies, I think it's pretty uncommon to validate by our, by the neurologist perspective, what patients are experiencing internally. And I think that's our failure as our, our tools aren't good enough to measure what the patients are experiencing. Mm -hmm. just, and that would be at the heart of what's going to be hard about clinical trials is we've, we're limited in the ways that we can measure things. And so what I didn't try to explain in these new modalities of measurement, we're trying to measure, for instance, by MRI, the fat accumulation of muscle. As muscle gets weak, it accumulates fat, and that can be accurately measured beyond your wildest dreams the same. And we're trying to measure sensory function in new ways. This is a trick that David Herman has. And we're developing tools called patient reported outcomes where patients themselves just say how they're doing compared to how they were doing. And every single one of those things, which need to be addressed and fully evaluated to know which ones are gonna to prove to be sensitive and reliable because the basis of objectively measuring whether a treatment works is gonna to fall to those measurements. Absolutely, very, very important questions and, and really tough. Yeah, it is, it's a tough dis disease disorder set. Carol, I, did you guys have your hand up over there? Yes, I had a question. Um, do you see, um, like in your experience, uh, a connection between CMT and um, like headache kind of issues? So again, it always helps to know what kind of CMT we're talking about. You don't have to divulge it. So I'll answer your question in general. So in general, CMT and headaches probably don't make a good marriage. Headaches being very common, CMT being very rare. So if you have a common issue that many people have, um, unless it's reported in particular with different kinds of CMT by patients themselves, I would say probably not. And so, you know, and, and headache itself, there's no one kind of headache, right? There's migraine headaches and even really rare kinds of headaches and even genetic kinds of headaches. And so depending on exactly the kind of headache, exactly the kind of CMT, and then what information can be brought to bear to say those do or don't associate is the key. To my knowledge, there's no good association between any kind of CMT and headaches, and maybe I just don't know everything that's known about that, but I don't think so. Good answer, thank you. Just want to be really respectful of Dr. Shear's time today on a Saturday. Um, maybe if there's one, or two last questions, final questions. 
from anyone? I think we hit on. I mean, I'm not billing by the hour here. <laughs> That's That's right. We have two minutes and 30 seconds left. Um, no, I'm kidding. Um, but just wanted to see if there are any final questions. I think that we really touched on so many incredible areas of CMT today. I am absolutely loved your presentation, Dr. Shearer. Thank you for sharing your time with us. Clark, do you have any final words of wisdom? No pressure. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to thank Dr. Shearer also. It was uh, really wonderful of you to come today and spend uh, some time on your Saturday to, to speak with us. Uh, we got Steve O'Donnell also on the line. Um, Steve, did you uh, want to say anything? Uh, just a couple things. Um, we were going to post this, and I guess, Laurel, maybe you can let everybody know where you're going to post it so people can go back to it. Um, I've known Steve Shear for quite some time, and there is no greater guy with care, and his heart is in this game all day long. So, Steve, for taking a Saturday, and I know you're a humble guy and, and you don't want to – take any extra credit for this, but to take the time and do what you're doing so we can get this out. It's changing people's lives, as you know, you do that for a living. Uh, and I want to let everybody on this phone know that, that you know, there are, you know, we have an all-star team. And of course, Steve is one of those all-stars. And, and he's one of the doctors that is trying to push this, this ball over the goal line for us. And they're working really hard to do it. Um, and, and I've been part of uh, doing this with him for a long period of time. So we're in no better hands. And, and Steve, thanks again for doing everything you're doing. I really appreciate it, buddy. Mm -hmm. That's very oh. kind. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm, I'm happy to do it. Honestly, my heart's in the game. And unless Michigan were playing football right now, <laughs> they have no <laughs> conflicts. <laughs> So, so, but Laurel, why don't we just talk about where you're going to post this? I guess it'll be in, in our website. So, because we, we're going to try to put together for everybody on the call, try to put together Laurel and I were talking about this before everybody got on. So there's going to be a bunch of these meetings. We're going to try to put a library together. So Steve doesn't have to have the same meeting in 70 different locations. So yeah. we're very fortunate to have him doing this for us now, but there will be other stuff that's coming out um, on our website. So Laurel, maybe, you know, Absolutely. So we actually already have a library on our website. And I think the most helpful thing to do would be for Clark to share that page from our website. And it is under Living with CMT and it says CMTA webinars and virtual programs. And that is where we have created a library of all of our recordings of past webinars, everything we were doing this year virtually in terms of meetings. So you can really go through and um, see what interests you. Do you want to watch a webinar on genetic testing? Do you want to watch a Zoom with um, uh, Dr. Pfeffer? Do you want to watch a webinar with our pulmonary specialist from our advi advisory board, Dr. El Saig? So that's a wonderful library that we need to continue pushing out to the public. And this is that is where you'll find this meeting, but it does take us a couple of weeks to we will edit this Zoom meeting and we'll add subtitles to it um, to make it easier for viewing. And then we'll add it to that library. But in the meantime, um, perhaps Clark can send a follow-up email to everyone and share the link to that page in our website. So we're I'd be happy to do that. grateful to you all for being here today and for making it such a special week, uh, meeting and to Dr. Shear for sharing his time and talents with, with us today. It was really great to have you all here. Good questions too. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks Clark for organizing. So great to have you back. Um, great to be back. I think you're yeah. the big organizer. <laughs> My pleasure. Thanks Steve O'Donnell for being here. Thanks Dr. Shear. Great to see you all. Enjoy your Saturday. Bye-bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye guys. Bye-bye.